So now we're going to have a conversation with uh, Lonnie Bunch. And Lonnie Bunch is uh, somebody that I've gotten to know reasonably well in recent years. Uh, Lonnie Bunch is uh, the uh, secretary, the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian. He's the first African American to serve as a, uh, the secretary of the Smithsonian. Uh, for those who may not know his background, Lonnie is a native of New Jersey, got his education, undergraduate degree, and his PhD at American University, uh, worked at the Smithsonian relatively early in his career, uh, had a number of other museum jobs in California and also the head of the Chicago Historical Society, and then was given the mission to come back by a prior secretary to build the African American History and Culture Museum, which he built from scratch with essentially no money at the outset and no staff at the outset. That museum is clearly one of the great successes of museum history in Washington around the world. And Lonnie was chosen not long ago to be the secretary of the Smithsonian. And uh, he is with us now. Lonnie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David. It's great to be with this August company. So uh, Lonnie, um, you have been a scholar of African-American history your entire career. Have you been surprised that the events in Minneapolis led to the worldwide protests we've seen, or did you think at some point this was going to happen? Well, I wasn't surprised that we would have another death, another moment that really lets us realize that issues of racial fairness and unfairness have been at the heart of the American experience. But I must admit, I have been really moved by the way the public has responded that often these are moments that shape the African-American community, but I'm seeing a diversity of Americans, in fact, a diversity of people around the world, actually saying this is a moment that might be a tipping point, that might allow America to finally come to grips with its tortured racial past and maybe make change. I am hopeful um, and I am moved by what I'm seeing around the country. Now, a Bank of America, in large part because you're the secretary of the Smithsonian and your background uh, at creating the and overseeing the African American History and Culture Museum, uh, provided a $25 million gift recently to the Smithsonian to provide you the, some, some uh, funds, which would be supplemented by another $25 million, perhaps, by other companies or other individuals that would enable you to produce a dialogue on race and some progress that could be made in this whole challenge. Can you describe what you're going to do with that money? Absolutely. I think the question for me is, what's the role of a place like the Smithsonian? How does the Smithsonian help make a country better? How does the Smithsonian help a country understand itself? And Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of, Bank of America, um, really got excited about the possibilities of helping the Smithsonian help America. So we've created this race, community, and our shared future. And in some ways, a lot of the goal is to create virtual town halls, opportunities to bring experts from around the country to work with local communities to help understand and have people understand how to talk about race, but more importantly, have people come together to say, here are concrete things we can do to help change a country. And my hope is this would allow the Smithsonian, which is uniquely situated um, to have people who are experts on African-American culture, Latino culture, Asian-American culture, to bring the resource of the Smithsonian actually and virtually to help change a country. So uh, 25 million was provided by Bank of America and you're gonna try to raise another 25 million. If companies are interested in participating in this dialogue in this program, uh, who do they send the money to or who do they contact? Basically you contract, contact the Smithsonian and our Office of Advancement is there to talk to you, and I'm always there to shake the hand. Okay. So, Lonnie, uh, I just saw a couple of things uh, about your own background. Uh, you grew up in New Jersey, and um, you uh, experienced a lot of racial discrimination in your growing up. Can you describe how you realized that uh, the country really wasn't living up to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in many ways when you were a younger person? Well, you know, growing up in a town where um, my brother and I were the only black kids in the elementary school um, and the only black family in the neighborhood, um, you learn early that some people treated you fairly, others treated you with disrespect. And I remember like it was yesterday, being eight years old, playing basketball in somebody's backyard, and the mother came out. And, and we kind of stood in the line because she brought out Kool-Aid, the drink of choice in those days, right? She brought out Kool-Aid 
And when she saw me, she said, this Kool-Aid is for everybody else. You drink the water fountain. And I never forgot how much that hurt. And I wanted to understand why some people cared and some people hurt. And history became my way of first trying to understand my little town, trying to understand me. And then it helped me begin to understand America. So in some ways, those early days shaped my interest not only in African-American history, but shaped my interest to use history as a tool to help a country look at itself and really find a way to be fairer and freer. So in some ways, I love being from New Jersey because it shaped everything I am. It taught me how to run, how to fight, and how to talk my way out of things. Um, but in many ways, it inspired me to say, how can I help through using history to address, to address the challenge of race that has always been a great chasm in America? Now, as we've been going through these protests, uh, many African-American men have been telling stories about their own experiences with police and so forth. Um, have you had any experiences like that? I think every black man in America has either had the discussions with his family about what happens when the police pull you over, move very slowly, make sure they can see your hands. But for me, it became more than a conversation in 1967. That was the summer of the Newark insurrections, the Newark riots, and my town was next to Newark. And I was walking in a neighborhood that wasn't my own, and a police officer stopped me, frisked me, said, what are you doing here? He kept asking me if I had matches, right? And I said, I'm, you know, I'm an athlete, I'm 13, I don't smoke. And he said, oh no, you must be from Newark and you're gonna to try to burn down our town. And I said, I don't smoke. And he threw me on the hood of the car. I remember how hot it was that my face was on the hood of the car and he held me down and kept saying, do you have matches? Do you have matches? And then when he finally asked my name, he recognized, oh, the Bunch family had been in this town for generations and he let me go. But I, I never forgot that all I was simply doing was walking in a place, a neighborhood that wasn't my own um, and it could have turned out much worse. When, you, when your father and mother drove to the South, what was that experience like when you used to go there uh, to the South? Well, first of all, we would do what many black families did, recognize you couldn't stop anywhere. So you would load up um, a thermos and you'd learn up, load up a picnic basket and blankets so that you could drive straight through. But I remember many a time, um, my father was the only driver when I was very young and he would get tired and he would pull into a place to rest and smoke a cigarette. Um, and I remember once he pulled into a place and it was a motel and the sign over his head kept saying white only. And I was terrified. My mother and brother were asleep and I was just, what is gonna happen? And I remember he came back in the car and he sensed my nervousness. And he said, remember, this is my America too. We've got the right to be everywhere. And I think those kinds of things just inspired me to try to live up to my father's standards and to help a country live up to the standards of its founding documents. And when you were younger, you visited the Smithsonian. What was different about the Smithsonian uh, than other places you might have visited? Well, when we would go to the South to visit my mother's family in North Carolina and we drive through Virginia, um, this was during the centennial of the Civil War. I was like many kids fascinated by this. And I would see signs that would say, you know, battle, Civil War battlefields or the Museum of the Confederacy. And I'd say to my dad, oh, let's stop. And he would always find an excuse. Oh, I've got to drive a few more miles to get gas. Um, he would never stop. And on the way back, I literally pulled out a map and said, I'm going to give you 20 miles notice so you can stop. And he never did. And normally we would drive straight through to New Jersey. But he came into Washington that day and he pulled in front of the Smithsonian in what was then the Museum of History and Technology. And he said to me, here's a place where you can go understand the past and not have to worry about the color of your skin. So for me, the Smithsonian, even as a teenager, was a place of possibility, a place that was fair, a place that had a great deal of education, and a place that means so much to me. And so when you and many others were very supportive of me becoming secretary, I kept thinking of that moment and thinking, here is my chance to repay an institution that mattered so much to some unknown African-American kid who was 13 years old. So Lonnie, you are, had a great job. You're running the Chicago Historical Society. You like living in Chicago, I understand. Somebody calls you up and says, 
we want to build a museum for African Americans in Washington, D.C. We don't have any money. We don't have any staff. But why don't you come back and do that? Uh, why did you take that job? <laughs> At first, I wanted to say no. But I realized that the Smithsonian has a mandate. It's a canvas. It has an opportunity to have people grapple with questions that they won't look at in other museums. And so I thought, as much as I love Chicago, and I love being president of the Chicago Historic Society, in many ways, that museum nurtured my soul. But I realized that if I could come back and help to be part of a team to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture, that would nurture the souls of all my ancestors, and it might help make America better. So I came back, and I was lucky to be able to have, bring on gifted people over time to build a museum that I think matters. Well, when you came back, um, how much money had Congress allocated and how much money had been raised by the private sector at that time? Oh, let's see. Um, now that I have a staff of one, we had an annual budget of about $1.5 million. Um, there had been no money raised. And in fact, I was bemoaning the lack of money being raised. And my oldest daughter said, well, here's $7, Dad, to start the fundraising. So I came back with $7 only. So uh, ultimately, how much money did it cost to build that museum? Ultimately, building the building cost about $550 million. Um, and that basically Congress paid almost 50%, but we had to raise that from so many other people. And what I think has been wonderful has how America embraced that. I think that people like you took the leadership to help make sure we had support. Corporate America really stepped in. And even more importantly, where the sort of I five and 20 and $50 that people set in saying, I don't have much, but I want to be part of building a place that helps America remember all of my ancestors. So how many artifacts did you have to put into the museum when you came back? <laughs> uh, when we started, we had nothing. Um, and I knew that even though we were going to do things that were driven by technology and virtual, at the Smithsonian, people come to see the ruby slippers, the, you know, the Wright Flyer. So my notion was we had to find collections. But I'll be honest, David, I didn't know if we could. And one day I was sort of worried about things and I kind of fell asleep watching television. And I woke up and Antique Roadshow was on. And I had never seen it. And I thought, what a good idea. So I stole the idea, reframed it, saving African-American treasures. And we went around the country asking people to bring out their stuff, not to take it or even value it, but to help them preserve grandma's old shawl or that 19th century photograph. And people then began to give us amazing collections. And that in essence, by the end of the time we opened, we had over 40,000 artifacts of which 70% came out of basements, trunks and attics of people's homes. So um, of all the artifacts, you have about I, I, how many artifacts total you have in storage and so forth? Is it 23,000 or? Almost 45,000. 45,000. And how many do you have on display right now? About 4,500. All right. And of those 4,500, the most popular single item in that museum is what? It is Chuck Berry's Candy Apple Red Cadillac. When Chuck Berry sort of gets to, I said to the Chuck, I want your guitar that you played some of those early Maybelline songs on. And he said, I'll only give you the guitar if you take the car. And I remember thinking, I do not want this car. Why do I want a 1970s Cadillac? But luckily, I'd hired very smart people who said, oh, no, this is important to Chuck Berry. It's important to tell his story. So then they convinced me to put it on display. And I remember thinking, people are going to be really embarrassed that we've got this amazing musical material, and then we've got this Cadillac. Wrong. Everybody wants to get their picture in front of that candy apple red Cadillac. It's become, I think, if not the number one, it's at least the number two spot for everybody to go to in the museum. So what was the emotion like on opening it in September of uh, 2016? Was it 2000 and 2016? Mm -hmm. President Obama, President Bush, um, many prominent people were there. What was it like for you to open it that day? It was both unbelievably satisfying and unbelievably frightening. Um, it was hard to believe that after 11 years of work, that day actually happened. And to see President Obama, President Bush push on the stage and, and the Chief Justice and many others, I remember thinking that I'm terrified. Um, you know, what am I doing on this stage? And I'll never forget when it was my turn to talk after 
John Lewis gave an amazing speech and George Bush gave what I think is one of the best speeches of his career talking about how uh, a great country confronts its past, doesn't hide from it. Um, I'm walking to the podium and I am really nervous and I hear people calling out my name and I'm Lonnie Bunch III. And for some reason I thought about my father and my grandfather, that in some ways the crowd was honoring them, that here were two people that were famous only to their family but the crowd was honoring in them. And when that happened, my nervousness went away. And as I look out at that crowd, I remember thinking that this is America at its best, diverse people coming together for the greater good of a country. And was your mother there then? Oh, my mother was there. She's still with us at 92. And the pride that she had, not so much in me, but the pride that she had that she saw in America, that, from her, that during her life, was riveted by Jim Crow and racial violence, as you saw in America, that as she said to me, was changed. And that this museum was a symbol of that change. She never thought that she would ever see a museum of African American history and culture on the National Mall. And so she, to this day, is still so proud of being there at that moment. So how many people have visited the museum so far? Probably over 8 million people. Um, and it's become one of the hardest tickets to get um, and what I love more than anything else, no matter where I go until this pandemic, the first question was, Lonnie, can you get me in? Um, so I like the fact that it's that important to people. What's the answer to that question? <laughs> well, I always tell the story that one day I got a call from a woman who said she wanted tickets, and I said, I don't do that. And she said, don't you remember I was your girlfriend in seventh grade? So I guess you got to have a little in, as we say in New Jersey, you got to have a little pull. <laughs> okay, so um, now why did you want to leave that museum, which you created, you built, you oversaw it, it's a great, a great view of Washington at the, in your office there, to be the secretary of the Smithsonian. Why did you want that job? And didn't your mother ask you the same question? <laughs> she did. My mother asked me, why would you do that? Um, I think in some ways, part of it was, again, because of that moment when I was a 13-year-old boy and the, and the Smithsonian let me learn about history. I always felt that building the museum was really all the staff's contribution to America. But being secretary was my way to thank the institution that shaped my life, that helped me believe in America, that gave me a career and a calling. I met my wife at the Smithsonian. So in some ways, this was both personal and professional. It was a great honor to become the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian, but it was also very personal. And so for me, this is my way to say, here is an organization that at its best is transformative. And I wanted to th thank you and help it become the kind of institution that would shape generations of other students, um, other kids in the future. Now, before you took over as a secretary, uh, you completed a book about the African American History and Culture Museum, uh, which is entitled A Fool's Errand, Creating the National Museum in the Time of Bush, Obama, and Trump. Okay, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. But uh, let's talk about the uh, reopening of the Smithsonian. Uh, when did you close the Smithsonian? On March, on March 9th, I closed the Smithsonian's buildings. But I said at that time, let us use our virtual assets to get our education out, to get our science and our history. So the key was to keep the Smithsonian serving the American public but also to realize that this was something none of us knew anything about, how to handle this pandemic. The staff was scared. I was worried about the Smithsonian Museums being kind of Petri dishes. So we closed in March. And then what I said was, let's think both about when we might be able to reopen. What does that look like? But also that this was going to be a new normal, that we weren't going to be able to go back to the way things were, that we had to rethink a lot about how the Smithsonian served the public. We had to rethink how we did social distancing. We had to rethink the role of the staff. So all of this was part of what we've been grappling with over the last three or four months to make sure that when we do open, we open safely and we open respectfully. And when do you think that might be happening when you do a reopening? I think what we're gonna to have to do is a phased reopening, opening parts of the Smithsonian in order to sort of understand better how the, how the audience wants to interact, to understand, to make sure that we can keep everybody safe, we can do social distancing. So my sense is that we'll begin that process um, in the summer, 
and that hopefully by the end of the summer, the Smithsonian will be reopened based on, you know, hopefully the pandemic and other issues will allow us to move forward. And you think people will need to wear masks when they come back to the Smithsonian? I think to be safe, we're going to have not just our staff, but we're going to expect the public um, to wear masks as well. Um, we think this is the best way to give the public the kind of experience they want. Because the one thing that we found out by our research is that when we open, 25% of the public will want to come back right away. But another 25% wants to see if there's a spike, what's going on with the pandemic. And we think by masking, we help people feel comfortable. But 50% may not come back till there's a vaccine. So we want to, So that really means that we've got to continue to serve both those that actually come in, but also to continue to push out our digital assets to serve those that want to come but aren't ready yet. So uh, you've lost a fair amount of revenue from your shops and other things that are closed. So when you reopen, are you going to charge admission? Uh, no, this is the Smithsonian is the gift to America. And so um, we're not going to charge admission. We're going to rethink our business models. We're going to think about e-commerce in different ways. We're going to think about how do we use our shops in different ways so that we're looking to try to make sure we fill that hole. But the reality is that we're going to have to think very differently in order to be efficient as we move forward. Now, I noticed uh, you're rebuilding one of your museums, the uh, National Air and Space Museum on the Mall. Uh, that opened in 1976, and uh, it had some challenges recently, so you're redoing it. When will that reopen? Well, um, as you know, the Air and Space Museum was where I first went to work at the Smithsonian, so I have a great love for it. And Part of the challenge was that it was a building built in 1976 that I think people didn't expect to last for 20 years. And so in many ways, we've had to rethink of that building and, and almost restrip it. So this is something that has been a challenge under the pandemic because we wanted to keep working on it, but there were supply issues and the like. Our goal is to sort of basically begin to have that building available for the public um, in 2021, 2022. So to make sure that ultimately by the time we get to 2026, that that building is open completely for the public to enjoy. So um, as I like to say, it was built in 1976 at a cost of $40 million uh, to GSA specs. Uh, and obviously the pyramids were built to the different specs than the GSA specs. So the pyramids have been around for a few thousand years. But when it opens up, uh, what will it have now cost to rebuild it, would you say? Would you say? I would say that it's, it's going to cost over $500 million. Okay. Uh, and I think what that does, though, is not only does it allow us to fix the structure, but it allows us to reimagine the exhibitions, to think about the visitor experience, to make sure one of the most popular museums in the world can continue to serve the public for generations to come. So the Smithsonian has 19 museums, but you also have some research centers. What do they do? I think one of the great mysteries of the Smithsonian is to let people understand the fullness of the Smithsonian. I am moved when I went up to the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory um, that they share with Harvard up in Cambridge. This is the group of scientists that helped to create the image of the black hole that was so popular, that's doing so much of the research about um, is there life in, on other planets. I go visit the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center um, out in the Chesapeake, and I'm struck by how the Smithsonian is doing cutting edge inno innovative research about species and water invasions and how to make sure we can protect our environment. I think that I am really moved by what we're doing at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, which is really looking at biodiversity and, and making a contribution, not just to understand, but to protect this. And then we have places that are working with um, animal species to make sure they're bred in the right way. But in essence, research is really the heart of the Smithsonian. Even the museums are profoundly shaped by the research that undergirds the history or the art or the science there. So that the Smithsonian is really in some ways one of the greatest educational sources in America. And what we want to do is amplify that, let the people, let the public know that, and make sure that our resources, be they scientific, cultural, historical, really help to shape the country and give it the tools it needs. Now, the current chairman of the uh, Smithsonian Board of Regents is Steve Case, who has a big background in technology and so forth. And with him, are you working to make sure that the technology 
of the Smithsonian is, is as modern as possible and people can do more online to visit the Smithsonian? I think Steve Case and the Regents have been very supportive of this notion that the wonders of the Smithsonian, the expertise of the Smithsonian, touches millions of people, but it could, it could touch millions and millions more. And so what we're looking at is, what is the virtual Smithsonian? What are the ways that we can accelerate getting our information and our content out digitally? As you know, one of the, one of the impacts of the pandemic is that more Americans are comfortable receiving content digitally than ever before. So we wanna do that. We wanna look at how do we partner? Because the Smithsonian, as big as it is, doesn't have big enough shoulders to do everything. So how do we partner with entities that are really leading edge when it comes to technology? And how do we create a culture that says the Smithsonian has to find the right tension between traditions and innovation to make sure that it's reaching into every home and every school? Because I think the Smithsonian is that valuable that it ought to touch everyone. And I think digitally we can do just that. So uh, you're coming to us from your home, is that right? Yes, I am in my, I'm in my house. And how has it been to spend a month or two in your house that you didn't expect to spend uh, before? So what's interesting is that when I do things like this from the house proper, my Wi-Fi isn't very good. So I had to kick my wife out of her artist studio because her Wi-Fi is better. So basically what I've been able to do is sort of um, negotiate a piece so that I can use some of our studio for part of the day. Um, but it's really been a challenge for me because I'm a good 19th century historian. I think one of the most innovative innovation, inventions is the fountain pen. So clearly um, learning how to zoom is, has been a challenge, but um, I think like everybody else, I've adapted to this new moment. So Lonnie, I've interviewed a number of men over the last couple of months who have grown beards because of uh, they didn't want to shave, I guess, but your beard is not something as a post COVID-19, this is a permanent part of your uh, uh, face, is that right? Yes, this was a beard that I grew when I was a professor at UMass and I was so young that I wanted to look older for the students. Now I have to figure out how to look younger. <laughs> okay, well Lonnie, on behalf of uh, all Americans, I wanna thank you for what you've done for the African-American History and Culture Museum and for our country and now leading the Smithsonian. And uh, thank you very much for giving us your insights on racial issues as well. And if people want to contribute to the uh, new project you have, they can contact your, your development officers or go to you directly. That's correct. Go to the Smithsonian website and we're there. Okay. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Thank you, David. Bye.